thrilled you're all here. We're, I wanted to little preface a little bit about how this show came about. Uh, for many, many years, we've been committed to periodically doing a faculty exhibition. A very important part, I think, of the experience students have to see the work of their faculty in a museum context. So we've been very committed to this idea. Uh, in recent years and in conversations with the curatorial staff at the museum, we thought maybe instead of doing a large uh, faculty exhibition where things didn't quite make sense together fully, it's just one of these, one of those kind of show, that it might be interesting to try a series of faculty focus exhibitions, and that's what we're calling these. And the first one uh, is this one with uh, Julie Weitz, Gregory Green, and John Bird. And I think Gregory, I know Gregory, came up with the title, Everyday Atrocities, so we'll ask him about that as a theme. And I thought tonight what we would do is this, that I would just um, open up very quickly to each of them with one question, and then I have a follow-up question, and then after that we will open it to the audience. This is not a two-hour defense of the exhibition. <laughs> And uh, it's a conversation, a friendly conversation about, I think, very significant work with some rather provocative themes. So uh, we're going to cut it off a little after 8, so it's really about a 45, 50 minute discussion, okay? So the first thing I'd like each of you to respond to, and we've had a number of people come in and ask questions, so I'll just ask it on their behalf. But how do you choose the imagery that you make as part of your work? What is the significance of the rather, uh, not rather, provocative, uh, symbolic images? How do you derive them? How do you develop them? And Gregory, we'll start with you. Oh, we'll start with you. Since you're sitting closer. <laughs> sure. That's not fair. Sure. Sure. Um, I don't know. In many ways, that's actually kind of a tough and very, 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 very long question. Um, but um, in reality, we're only looking at one very limited body of, 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 of uh, one, one little limited suite of, of many different bodies of my work. Um, in short, the work that I've been doing since, um, well, 1988, when I first did the pipe bomb over the corner, is really about an exploration of uh, different strategies of empowerment, um, specifically starting with what, I, what we all sort of traditionally understand as ways that an individual or group can affect or change their society. Um, and also what I find to be, found to be the most uh, morally reprehensible strategy, which is the utilization of violence, particularly the utilization of violence on a small scale. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things that, that earlier I decided I wanted to talk about um, was actually um, a dis discussion that I had with my students in my intermediate sculpture class today. Um, and uh, we came in, uh, the project that we're working on right now is called The Object of Self. And the project itself is supposed to be, you know, find what, out what are the core basic issues that drive your work, what are the source of your work. Um, and in the discussion with them today, I, I did something I actually never did before. Um, and that is I talk like a human being. Um, not like somebody pretending to be an artist or somebody trying to give you know the academic line about what their work is about, but actually just sort of told them the truth. Um, and my work um, comes um, from my my whole self, my development as a child and my development as an adult. And um, I grew up in Europe um, as a child um, uh, in the 60s and 70s. And uh, this, uh, in the 60s, it was the height of, of, of you know, the heavy-duty fear of the Cold War. Um, we were, uh, I was in uh, France um, from uh, 61 to 67. And as a young child, I was born in 59. Um, and as, as a child, when I first started going to kindergarten in the first grade, um, uh, we, in, in Europe, in the military bases, they, they, they'd stopped in the United States. Um, we were still doing duck and cover, um, and uh, still seeing those duck and cover movies and all these other movies. Um, and I have vivid memories of that as a child. Um, and then as, you know, a late baby boomer child, you know, the, the, the Cold War was a major part of, 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 of our generation. Um, and I was, 
continually and constantly aware of, of that. Um, and it was a central issue uh, in my own personal development and thinking. And uh, as a teenager, um, I in no way believed um, that I'd probably live past 40. I was sure that I would die in some sort of nuclear uh, confrontation. Um, and uh, so after De Gaulle kicked all the Americans out of France in uh, 67, um, I returned to uh, Europe and Belgium uh, in uh, about 72, 71, and uh, was there until I came back to the United States to go to college. Um, and uh, the 70s Europe um, was a political hotbed, uh, from communism to, to ultra-capitalism. Um, as a teenager, I, I was a real Ayn Rand fan, um, and so I constantly argued with all the, uh, the socialists in the school that I went to. I went to an international boarding school that had all of the, uh, all of, uh, all of the different nations of NATO. Uh, um, and so the uh, political discussion was a constant reality. Um, the Cold War was still there. And within the Cold War, basically, it was going to start with this huge tank battle um, in Germany, primarily, um, and then spread throughout uh, most, of, most of, uh, of, of Eastern and Western Europe. And that tank battle was supposed to last about a day. And then they were going to kill, everybody would have killed each other by the end of the tank. Um, and then it would have went to small-scale uh, nuclear weapons. And I forget, I forget exactly what the numbers were, but I read this one uh, military document once that was, you know, saying how the war would go. So within, within, uh, and I think it was like within 18 hours after that, uh, we would have exhausted um, the small scale nuclear weapons and would have gone to large scale nuclear weapons. So um, this, this was the environment in which I grew up. This was the environment that formed me as a person. Um, and this, this, this is an issue and idea that is critical to all of my work. Um, <coughs> My earlier work um, talked about um, techniques, methods, strategies in which uh, governments, uh, churches, institutions, any, any structural power uh, can utilize to manipulate and control us, the population, the people. Um, and in, in that work, um, it, it was all about uh, doing work that illustrated um, those strategies, that talked about those strategies. But within that work, I was always the victim. I was still the victim. I was the victim when I was a child, and so I wanted to, uh, you know, I wanted to do something that that didn't make me the victim. Um, and when I first started the work that I've been doing for the last 20, 20 years, <laughs> um, uh, I, I actually didn't even know what I was doing. I did the pipe bomb, as I said, in nineteen eighty eight. Um, I didn't know why I did it. I just knew I wanted to do it, and I needed to do it for some reason. I did the piece, I put it in the studio. It sat, sat in the studio for a year and a half with me looking at it every once in a while. Um, and then one day it was like, you know, half of a little light bulb went off. And the next day another half of a little light bulb. And suddenly I had some sort of idea of, uh, of why in the world did I want to build that dumb light bulb. Um, and uh, it wasn't probably until three or four years afterwards that um, I could spend an hour plus and talk to you about all of issues that are behind the work that I've been doing for the last 20 years, and we don't have time to do that. Um, but in short and in conclusion, um, I'd like to say that, that um, even though on the surface, um, and maybe this is an inclusive conclusion, anyway, uh, maybe I'll go on another uh, track, but in short, um, my work really comes from being a, a scared little child who could, had no control over his world and his immediate life, um, and if within the work that I've been, this work and the work that I've done since this body of work has been about a search in terms of how I can um, have a sense of power and control within my own life, and it's a way to offer it to you as well. The work that you're seeing here is not very happy or positive work, um, and in many ways, this work works on many different ways, but the core for everything comes from that. Um, but each one of these pieces I could talk about on various sorts of levels. And uh, just very, very, very quickly before I hand it off to whoever else. <laughs> um, one way, one important way to think and to look at this work 
is that um, it's not just a sculptural object um, within this gallery. Um, they're meant to be social objects. They're meant to be relational objects. They're meant to exist outside of the gallery itself. And when you look at them, you have no clue um, whether I promote violence or I, 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 I'm opposed to violence. And that's actually a strategy within the work. When you look at my body and my work as a whole, um, you can begin to see you know, exactly, really more specifically what I'm talking about. Um, but uh, in many ways, uh, one, well, actually, Jeffrey Deitch once uh, wrote a, a, a piece on me um, for a catalog where he talked about the fact that I'm a conceptual terrorist. And these works are the personification of those works um, or that idea. Um, if you think about terrorism, terrorism is in a cold, short, simple way um, an event of spectacle that uh, creates a form of public, primarily media interest, um, from which the perpetrator of that event then is given a platform to speak to the public and the media. Um, and very cold-hearted way to look at it, um, but looking at it that way, um, I've said this before, and maybe some of you have heard this, um, I would say that Greenpeace is one of the most brilliant conceptual terrorist organizations in the, place, in the world. Um, and these piece, pieces are meant to be that way. The idea when you put a potentially, potentially functional bomb in a gallery space and call it art, that is ripe with tabloid potential, with media potential, um, with the potential of, of misunderstanding, understanding, of just, it's, 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 it is a form of, 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 of public spectacle, which the media then responds to. And in the, in the process of me responding to the media, I am then given a, 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 public, a, a public platform um, to speak about not only the issues that the work brings up, but also other issues um, uh, that, that I regularly talk about um, when I am in those situations. Um, that strategy has been incredibly successful in Europe, but not so successful in the United States where, where culture is seen um, you know, with great suspect um, and isn't even covered by the media anyway. Um, so, John? Um, yeah, I'll say that, uh, so I was a child of the uh, late 70s, early 80s, I grew up in a <clears throat> small town in the mountains of North Carolina, um, relatively uh, culturally isolated. So my reference to the Cold War, by and large, was through movies like Red Dawn and Rocky IV. <laughs> <laughs> and the point being that my consumption of things was relatively simple. Um, and that kind of my understanding. I, I think um, contextually, even now, I can trace predominantly all my formal decisions um, on childhood years, probably ages three through about 10 and kind of my understanding I had of things and things that in particular perplexed me. And um, more specifically, it's something I bring up a lot, but I was given by a next door neighbor who had traveled to the exotic world of the Southwest, you know, um, Arizona, um, returned and brought me this like paperweight that had essentially a scorpion trapped in the blue side. And I mean, it drove me absolutely nuts because it's this, you know, you know by and large, the scorpion was essentially as alien as anything I'd ever seen. And, in fact, it was trapped in this plastic. I knew the thing was dead. I, it, it wasn't an issue, but I couldn't like you know, um, access this thing, and it frustrated me, kind of drove me nuts. And this notion that this thing was sealed and separated from me um, was, you know, I think, clearly kind of a, a formal influence on in some of the work that uh, you see in here. And I, again, I think most of my source work is relatively uh, accessible. And part of that, I think, is the fact that. Um, you know, growing up there in Hendersonville, I've always tried to, I don't know, intuitively I've always tried to make work that didn't necessarily alienate the people that I grew up with who weren't necessarily educated about art. I'm sure that we call them like an homage, but it was never important for me to, uh, you know, uh, kind of distance myself from that study. So, that's about what I have to say. Well, I would say, in context to the title of the show, Every Day, I was thinking about the relationship of my images to that title. And um, clearly, my images come from a, an idea of, um, they're, they're based off images that appear every day in our media in some form or another. So uh, for a while, for the past maybe six years, I was just collecting images that I would cut out of the New York Times. And I sort of play this game that, and I don't get the New York Times anymore because they don't deliver to my neighborhood. But when I did, where you open the New York Times,
sometimes, in, in somewhere in that paper, you're going to find an image of someone with some kind of scarf, some kind of head covering, some kind of hat that distinguishes them in a particular way as a kind of a, some kind of marker of national, political, religious identity. And um, I became very interested in that. And so it sort of also became about comparing these and grouping them together and trying to understand them. And, and this idea that the image of a hooded figure um, was presented by the media, but the, the idea of the figure behind the hood was, wasn't explained. So there was no why. So there was a picture and you know maybe a little media bite about who, what this image represented in terms of its ideological position, but there was no why. So as an artist, I began to think like how that would be an interesting kind of structure to set up for myself where I would attempt to get to know my subject despite the fact that it's hooded, but through the process of actually forming it visually in a painting, I would somehow understand something more about the figure underneath it. And um, in some ways, I think that's a kind of failed setup for myself. But in other ways, I think that um, the grouping of them begins to, there begins to develop this other kind of dialogue. So, uh, they're not isolated figures, and um, in beginning to research hoods, it became obvious that it's not just the terrorists wearing the hood, it's the, um, it's the prisoner, it's the, it's, so it's the victim, it's the oppressor, it's also um, certain kinds of coverings can just be a kind of cultural, religious um, ritual, and so there was not necessarily like a negative, positive, or, or um, fear and pleasure mixed. It was, it's, there's a certain level of ambiguity, and I just became interested in the possibilities for understanding identity. Um, you know, in a way, it's, it's this idea that it's a kind of visual sign that distinguishes one group from, not, from another. So it's, it's um, identities forming themselves against the other. Uh, but at the same time, I'm hoping, I think the intention of my work is to also create a space where you begin to question or even visually try and have the desire to understand what's underneath, what's giving form to this shape. Um, and yeah, I could say more in a question period, but generally that's where I get my images. And, and really it's an everyday kind of experience of um, it's, it's sort of amazing when you look through the paper. There's always like a new form of a hood, or a new kind of wrapping. And then again, I'm also inventing my own. So, um, you know, I'm using different kinds of patterning and, or I'm applying a certain way that um, a certain identity would wrap with a different kind of material or something like that. Well, I'll follow up and start with Julie since you just mentioned intention. And my next kind of line of questioning, I think, comes from, again, responses from viewers coming into this show. But what about the relationship of reception and intention? And while you're talking rather generally about the formation of identity, some of the scars for people coming into the exhibition are very clearly associated with the group, and you've put them into a context with other people wearing scarves that create a dialogue or a tension between those. And one viewer coming in uh, even suggested she was insulted by the, uh, particularly in this work, by the context of the sacred scarf with the other wrapped figures. Yeah, so I mean, that's the, that's the difference between working in your studio and then presenting your work to the public. So um, in my studio, um, it's a different kind of processing. It's sort of inquisitive. What happens if I put this next to this? What happens if I you know, throw this hood in this way? Or something? whatever it is, the kind of visual choices or questions that you're asking yourself. There's always the implication in my thinking that these somehow have kind of political uh, reverberation or something like that, and, and I and I might know that I'm doing something provocative, but the intention is not necessarily uh, to be provocative. And and I guess it, 
and, and then I, I would say that the response, like I was sort of shaken up when I heard that response because I've sort of been in this safe place where um, I am not involved in any kind of community, uh, any kind of cultural or political community, I would say here, where in the past I have been and I'm used to having sort of disagreements or political arguments. And, Sometimes I even feel like Florida, or even this isn't a very political campus, and I mean, you know, Florida is not the most politically active, conscious place, so I don't really, I, I sort of think of things in a neutral way, but um, point being that I'm interested in um, evoking different kinds of responses because the hope is that it creates some sort of dialogue. And, um, you know, I, maybe the most kind of interesting responses are, are insulted responses I'll get sometimes from my family members, you know, they'll be really upset, like why, like a question like that, why are you putting the talis, which is the um, religious prayer shawl for um, Jews, with um, kufiya, which is a Palestinian head uh, scarf wrap, and you know, why? I, you know, I mean, I'm not here to give you an answer, I'm just hoping that the work will provoke that question perhaps, and that maybe through a discussion, it, you know, some new ideas will come from it. But how much do you rely on the viewer making that those associations? Oh, uh, well, I can't. I mean, if they can recognize, great. I mean, I think with any work of art that you approach, you have a limited knowledge base that you're bringing to it, and the more you're exposed and the more you learn, the deeper the work can um, access of the work can be for you. But well, John, how do you respond to people who are aghast at the little fawn? Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Um, again, I grew up in this like rural area, so I didn't have my, my parents weren't from there. My mother's from the deep south. My dad's actually from England. But you know, I grew up with a lot of friends who essentially were hunted and were consumers in a particular kind of way. That I would, again, it was a culture that was um, kind of alien for me. And so I've always felt like I think most artists do at some point, like you know, kind of consummate observer, you know, outside of looking in. And so in many cases, this is you know, a bit of a reaction to that. I think you know, it's like when I got to this point where I could activate this role that I was never able to have as a child. Um, that was part of it. Um, and in terms of that, and the notion of consumption, I'm like. I'll say this, that all the projects, are just, when I design them, you know, I think of them in a very kind of experiential way. It's about putting myself in a particular situation that's going to make me really comfortable. And I say that in the, in the notion that I am essentially both an animal lover and, you know, fighting, I say I fight for animal rights, but I'm also a consumer in the fact that, you know, I, I do eat meat. So and, and I have trouble talking about it without obviously contradicting myself many times uh, within a single paragraph. And that's part of the notion, the idea of the work is kind of like, um, displaying the word, you know, the kind of hypocritical notion, but the idea of both honor and consumption at the same time. So, um, I certainly won't try to take a stand on one way or another in terms of the animal rights issue because, again, due to my conflicting uh, feelings about it, I don't necessarily feel like I'm in a good place for that. Are you shooting these animals and taxiing uh, them? That's a good question. I don't, I don't necessarily tend to talk about that. I will, uh, but generally, I, I like to display the work without actually clearing that up. Um, <laughs> I can, I can though, if there are any questions about this. So the, uh, the uh, kittens, for instance, um, yeah, exactly. First you get a pillowcase, you know. Uh, <laughs> so the, the kittens actually come from, I mean, the, the, reality, the, the reality is that, you know, that we have enormous, like, thousands of cats that are euthanized animal shelters, like, on a daily basis. So these are three kittens that were euthanized in a Houston animal shelter. And essentially after that happens, they're sent to a crematorium. So I received them while we were the crematorium. Uh, so it's just, obviously there's a level of tragedy with, with I mean, hopefully with a piece like this, but you know, I would point the tragedy at the uh, you know, uh, you know, the fact that people don't get their uh, you know, pets paid or neutered. Um, in this particular piece, like the fawn, for instance, um, it's, it's illegal against federal law to um, take a fawn. So that one actually um, was hit by a car, and I have like sites numbers and a notebook that I can like you know, get that to. The ducks came, the ducklings in there came from a duck farm. You know, a certain percentage of those. Um, just die of natural causes. Now, obviously, you can argue the uh, I don't know, uh, ethical, you know, relevance of, of, of you know raising ducks in a farm, deer in a, in a farm uh, for meat. Um, but essentially, by and large, most of the animals I use, I'm not, you know, I try to avoid being directly responsible for their consumption. That said, I can't trace, for instance, like the rabbit, the squirrel. I mean, I'm assuming they're shot. I mean, I bought those already taxed on eBay, just as they. Mm -hmm. 
use it. I'm sorry, I mean, the point is I am willing to take like a certain, you know, a bit of a role there. And then a different piece like a notion of like the, like the robot, for instance, um, that's kind of a different thought process for me, which is, you know, there's a lot more kind of work and craftsmanship in a way that the head of the chipmunk in there kind of disappears, hopefully in a certain way, like it becomes less kind of valid. Um, as it's weighed against, let's say, the labor or the maybe poten potential humor of the rest of it. You know, that's kind of the idea for me is like, can I create an object uh, by which I can like, justify the ego necessary for that consumption? You know, it's like, can I make this thing so cool? Which is not really possible with the idea that I, as an artist in the process, can uh, negate the fact that I consume this thing by making something that might you know, theoretically create a, you know, an honor that was greater than the animal's life. Again, that's impossible. I realize that, but that's kind of like. The, but, suspension you, but, of but then you push it all to the kitsch, to the humor, to sure. the wit. And how do you... Well, that, that helps me, like, the wit, definitely, for me, in a piece like that, is to kind of erase that consumption in a way. Because, you know, it's not just like, to erase the notion of consumption, that something like this is so kind of, uh, um, you know, heavy set with, you know. I mean, um, I mean, calling this piece like a snow globe, but all this stuff's kind of jammed in there and kind of floating around. But it's more kind of obvious and uh, kind of aggressive form of Gregory, you talk about um, the work having a, an effect, uh, almost social, uh, the possibility of social transformation, at least in terms of someone's recognition of in issues of empowerment or fear of being wiped out by a nuclear bomb. When you put uh, the, the survival bomb in a, um, uh, with a hood on it, uh, or you, uh, which seems a very different way of locating the piece even in exhibition than the way in which the pipe bomb has been put in a corner. Mm -hmm. Or even moving these works out into the world, if you were to drop your suspicious bag off at the mall, uh, people would have a very different response to it. There's a sort of, no pun intended, but you diffuse in the sense that the fear aspect by the context of the museum. Well, the context of the museum, yes, um, will do that to just about anything. You put something in a museum, and it immediately becomes a precious object, and it immediately becomes art. Well, you um, also talked when we were but, installing the exhibition about how you had a different strategy in a group show sometimes than you did when you were setting up something as an installation. And so uh, I just, I guess my question is about responses or, or reception of the work based on the context in which you present it. The way in which you Well, to go back to the way you originally um, defined the question, yes, the work is meant to be provocative. It is meant to provoke you. It is meant to get a response from you. It is meant to be somewhat confused, potentially angry, potentially scared. The idea of sitting, sitting at the, the, the pipe bomb back in that corner, slightly hidden, the light's not even on it. The suspicious looking package is not even lit, and it's sat next to two other white objects on the wall, a light switch and a, and a, and a, and a fire, uh, uh, some extinguisher. fire extinguisher. Um, uh, it is, both of those are not traditionally installed. And within the strategy of the installation of those particular works, the fact of coming around and discovering it um, is part of the work itself. The fact that it's not that it is not identified, or uh, other than actually being in this room as an official piece of art, and all the official pieces of art are lit. Um, the Bible itself, um, the Bibles can often be rather controversial, um, and in the past I've had one defaced. Um, and uh, so the Bible is actually underneath the case to literally protect it. Um, and uh, you know, the Bible itself is about many, 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 many different ideas. But I'm actually going to go back to um, Julie um, and uh, her response to your question relative to the talus. Um, one important thing to remember is right now in our world we think, okay, terrorism, it's purely an Islamic Muslim. Well, no, it's not. Um, uh, Jewish extremist terrorists killed Rabin. The assassination of a, of a, of a leader in a particular direction um, in a society is an act of terror. Um, bombings of abortion clinics, 
assass assassination of abortion doctors, bombings of lesbian nightclubs, all of those are Christian terrorist acts. We've been in a Christian terror campaign since the late 70s. Um, and the number of terrorist attacks by Christians in this country, uh, I don't have enough digits to count them all. Um, so, you know, I'm going off on a little side, maybe something that just I want to talk about. Maybe I'm not answering your question. Maybe well, no, I'm, I, mean, I think I think it's one point. The Boston Tea Party was essentially a terrorist yeah, attack. Yeah. So, um, you know, KKK. KKK. Um, it's been along for ages. You know, Oklahoma City. Um, yeah. So. Well, what do you think that your work functions differently post 9/11? Um, the work functions very, very differently. Um, and actually, um, one, you know, I said that the, the works, the, the works work on many, many, many different levels, um, and the bomb works, and a number of other uh, works related to the utilization of violence or the utilization of terror in society. All of those works. Um, were, were really come out of, of me, uh, the, the sort of the political growth of myself, um, growing up out of, outside of the United States, growing up um, in what was in many ways disempowered Europe, um, and thinking about the out, out, outsider and, and, and the disempowered and the disenfranchised in our world. Um, and if, if, if we, as the, the, one of the dominant cultures um, uh, in, in our global society, ignore and do not respond to um, those people, to the, to, to the disenfranchised, to the helpless, to the forgotten, to the unknown, um, then really the only option that they have to utilize to be able to be recognized is the utilization of violence. Um, but Julie, it seems to me that yours are even more, are more specific because they're drawn out of current media imagery. So when we look at this, we feel like, well, we may have just seen that in, on television, on the news, or as you said, in the New York Times, or maybe even remotely once in a great while in the Tampa Tribune. Yeah. Well, I mean, one thing is, though, that, I mean, it's interesting to hear you talk about your work and the way you, I, I, I don't want to speak specifically about political issues. That's another conversation. My, my hope is that the work can instigate a discussion that obviously um, specific moments in history or political uh, arguments will arise from the imagery. Um, but I, I think in some ways, even if I'm speaking specifically visually, I, I'm less um, apt to speak specifically verbally and articulate what I'm thinking about. But clearly I'm responding to um, events of our time. And it was interesting thinking about the question you asked, how's your work changed since post 9-11? And I was thinking, well, my work developed, you know, post 9-11. That really, I made the choice. I, I entered graduate school um, right when it was like the first week of graduate school when September 11th happened. And I just got back from, uh, I had left, uh, a, I was working in Israel that summer and I left early because there had been a bombing right in downtown Jerusalem where I, I regularly was. And so uh, I had had this idea that when I returned to America, I was like, oh, yes, okay, just get, you know, I could distance myself from political conflict and, and terrorism and a sense of um, fear and anxiety about world politics and, and clearly, like, wake-up call, right, for all of us with 9-11. So after that, I mean, it took a long time for me to process all of my experiences. And you know, I, and I'm speaking on a personal level, not even on a kind of more social, global level. But I think, you know, like I, I decided as an artist, if I was going to pursue it, that I couldn't not respond to the daily occurrences that were, that continued to occur. But John, and in, 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 in a sense, you've talked about animal rights, et cetera, but I have a feeling that that has very little to do with the meaning of the work. And in what sense do you think it provokes uh, um, the viewer to think about the contemporary culture in which we live, or yeah, social I mean, issues? I'm always, um, yeah, I mean, social issues obviously kind of look at, you know, uh, animal rights realm, I guess. Or maybe just generally the notion of this kind of um, proactive and this sort of ego in terms of like consumption and justification of that 
But well, I'm definitely always um, curious and surprised by people's reaction to it because it's sometimes it's the people I think would be most kind of affected are the least. So I mean, the idea hopefully with the animals in general. And I started up, my background is actually clay and ceramics. And uh, I began making, actually at the beginning of graduate school, um, animals and my skills are getting better. And so it's some notion there was this like uh, importance of craft to me in terms of like having this incredibly labored objects that essentially um, because of the you know, overt notion of labor and how much time I'd spent carving them, had some kind of you know, uh, revelation for me and hopefully the viewer in terms of uh, my commitment to this idea that I had. But then I was you know, always surprised at you know, how much more you know, affecting potential, I would probably say I was making an animal, but how much, making an animal, but how much more affecting like, an actual like, animal specimen was. I think this is natural notion of viewers and myself included as the artist, this kind of empathic response where in some way you kind of I wouldn't say put yourself in place with the animal, but I mean, it's, it's a different experience than having a representation of an animal. So they're really functioning metaphorically. Yeah, symbolic. yeah I think, you know, in, in, in some cases, you know, and then, but then in terms of like the people who, and then who's affected and who's not, um, and, who, and, and that response, I mean, again, a lot of that goes back to the culture in which I was from, and, you know, and it's always interesting, the people that I knew who hunted, their experience was much different than people, for instance, like coming into an art gallery, you know, those, um, you know, obviously, experience of natural history means things of that nature. I mean, it's just, I've recontextualized the taxonomy a little bit, the actual amount of it's not really that, that, that tremendous. Um, but then I think the idea of, like, you know, attaching some, like, kind of uh, banal, uh, decorative gesture to it in terms of its actual functionality uh, is in some ways kind of rude. And I'm always surprised at the way taxidermists as well react to my work. In some cases, they think it's actually kind of sick, you know, whereas, you know, they have, you know, they have, they have the turkey sitting on a fence with a golf fish inside on it. That, that's fine, you know. That's, that's just why the way these things are constructed. It's, 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 it's always surprising to me. Though. Can I, can I really quickly. Up to questions. Yeah, I, I, I just want to finish my previous answer. In many ways, these these works were were warning signs, were were were, were examples of the potential of chaos that could exist if we ignore this franchise in the world. I was doing them. Um, to illustrate the potential for chaos in our world um, under that situation. And one distinct, very, very um, uh, strong thing that 9-11 had in my work is that uh, oh, it, it devastated my career. Probably three quarters of my exhibitions were canceled. All of my sales um, uh, essentially ceased. Um, people were essentially afraid to, see, to show the work. And since the Patriot Act, Legally, um, even now, um, and prior to the Patriot Act, Patriot Act, all of the works are considered models legally. As long as there's no um, live explosives inside of them, or no materials to make explosives within 13 feet. However, after the Patriot Act, and this is to explain the sign out front, uh, the Please Be Advised sign, um, after the Patriot Act, um, a certain portion of the Patriot Act is written in such a way that if someone were to come into the gallery and be frightened by the work, they're illegal. But as long as no one is frightened, whatever that is, um, they're legal. And, uh, Do we have some questions from the audience? We have about another 20 minutes or so. Definitely, there's been no change. Um, as long as all the right paperwork is done, um, it's easier to ship them internationally than it is to ship them. States. Just as a strange aside of weird federal laws, um, I, I cannot legally drive that one across state lines. Oh my god. Because <laughs> it's a domestic animal. Oh. Law. <laughs> cool. hey, did you drive it? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Where did somebody else? <laughs> I'm curious, Julie and John, about the humor in your work, about the role that humor plays, slapstick, and kind of a wryness in your work. Well, but I'm, that up. Um, I'm always, I'm unsure if people see the humor, but of course I hope they do, and I think it's in there. Um, well, since you guys all sort of did a little biography about what influenced you since you were a little kid, I guess I would add here that I grew up thinking I was going to be a cartoonist. And so the way I ended up back, this, back to these kind of images was really exciting to me and a surprise that it, I mean, they're somewhat based in this kind of, I think, iconography, so um, cartooning being this kind of um, how can you express in the most simplest or economic form 
um, some sort of type of expression or some kind of identity in a way. And, uh, and so the goods sort of function that way. But also humor being a way to, to lighten up really loaded images and to make them accessible and to, um, you know, to, to make it, uh, I guess, more complex in a way that it's not just about uh, a sense of fear, but a sense of um, curiosity or a sense of pleasure with, mixed with a, a sense of disgust. And so humor just becomes another element that I hope will allow some more complex relationship for the viewer to engage the work and um, to also, again, like enough the sense that it's, um, I, I don't want the work to become heavy handed in its political uh, reference. Yeah, and I think that, that answers a lot of what I would say too. That, that kind of push pull and kind of beautiful and so what disturbing is definitely important to me. And I'm always like curious and interested where that line falls for different people. I and mean, again, like many times based on their kind of uh, you know, history or relationship with things like animals and uh, consumption of that nature. Um, but definitely, I think more of my current studio practice and maybe the work you see here, I think humor is becoming more important. And in some ways, for me, it's like a personal, and it's humor for me that I don't necessarily have a real resolution to, or <coughs> an actual joke per se, but um, again, for me, it deflects this notion of consumption, you know, and it's, uh, in terms of my personal activity. But then it's still important that then maybe I have to ramp it up, ramp up my notion of consumption, get me uncomfortable again, you know, which I think would be uh, interesting. And then I think there's even something probably in both our work of the ridiculous, like how ridiculous, sure. like how many animals can you fit into that snow globe? So like the ridiculousness of putting on, you know, a white hood and then going out and like, you know, doing these horrible murderous acts, like it's sort of silly. Yeah. And then a weird bit of a side in terms of like that, I don't know how this relates, but this piece, this, this one is called Snow Globe. Um, not too long ago, I was um, actually negotiating a sale of that piece to the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum. And I, was, I was so excited because I was I just loved to have this, lo this like, line of Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum on my resume. And pretty much I would have given it to them, you know, just to have a line on there. And then I made the mistake about, I don't know, this was going back and forth for several weeks, and I made the mistake of sending them like, an artist statement. And then they were like, oh, it's an art piece. And then they, 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 in terms of humor, they like, constructed, I think, some kind of myth of like, how this thing had been like, created. And like, I don't know if they thought it was some blue backwoods dude in his trailer, and it was just not a creative piece. But then like, outside of that context, it was no longer interesting to them. And they were like, oh, not, never mind. And I was just like, you know, okay. So, yeah, oh, okay. Another questions? Yes. Um, so for Julia and John again, um, you were talking about not being provocative or not wanting to provoke her. But I guess you were talking about humor, so I don't know, I'm interested to hear in how you maybe think it might be provocative work, because to me it can be. And then for John, I guess my thing is, I'm looking at SE narrative. You were talking about ego and personality, so. Well, I think I, I misstated myself. It's not that I don't think the work's provocative, and I, you know, I hope, of course, it is. I hope all art's provocative in a certain way. Um, when I'm making it, I'm not thinking, oh, if I make this move, it's going to be really provocative. You know? um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. You're, you're really you do the that. spectacle <laughs> sensation. Um, how is it provocative? I don't know, I just we were talking about humor and I just find that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think definitely, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't say my work's not intended to be provocative, but I just, not doing so with a particular stance in mind, just because I, don't, I also don't know what that stance is sometimes. Mm -hmm. Do you um, put a narrative element? Well, I mean, I think narrative in the sense that I, I've always been interested in my work, I think pretty much everything I made, having some kind of indeterminate history in terms of its creation. Um, I mean, typically when I look at work, it's like my first like intuitive like kind of reading or trying to figure out, I was trying to figure out about the artist. In some cases, you know, I, I hope that um, you know, I don't know I don't know how people would see or visualize me as an artist with a collection of my work, but singular pieces like that. I mean, I get very curious about. I would think that was just really strange. Like again, I get, for me that myth that sense is created by some hillbilly back in the hills. So I can appreciate the idea That's of that. Part of the humor. Yeah, no, indeed, indeed, because it's like, who would do this? You know, I don't know. But, I mean, even it I think looks like that naive man. art in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think which I think contradicts the craftsmanship. Sure, and that, that's that's definitely yeah, that's definitely. Um, 
something that I play with. I mean, generally speaking, is, again, my background is, I'll talk a little bit about this in the humor. Uh, um, generally speaking, uh, again, my history's in clay, so, especially within like a fine arts crowd, and we ceramic artists kind of a chip on our shoulder because it's, you know, the hierarchy of materials, clay's like right at the bottom, right? Not at the bottom, I mean, it's, you know, it's below glass, which is, you know, above bronze or steel, or painting, or bomb, it's a certain place. Place. <laughs> exactly, it's a in the clay, and mud, and all that stuff. Um, yeah, exactly. So there's always been a, always been a thing for me about like kind of manipulating materials and say that it's lower end of the hierarchy, and then doing it in such a way that somehow they can kind of ascend that. I think you definitely ascended. But, 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 but for me, it's like learning what, what's what's even lower on the you know the aesthetic ladder uh, than Tax clay, <laughs> taxidermy, and cast plastic. Yeah. You know, and I, and I think like that piece um, over there is a dog that's based on those who don't know like the ceramic uh, history. That's based on Dresden mice and uh, figurine. And not to get them lost or in the you know, historic tradition of the mice and factory. There's like how they put these things together were essentially like industry secrets. So the uh, first mice they were crafting to hell. Um, and of course they're considered failures, but now they're like, incredibly revered ceramic objects. So then the idea of presenting that to a collector in such a way that like one side is in a very highly developed and the other side is completely shorn of detail, it's like polished like epoxy surface, so it's like a trade-off. It's like, you know, for me the humor is, you know, introducing this to a, you know, a, a market and then saying, well the trade-off is you have to be willing to accept the other side, it's like it's made of plastic, as well as it's taxed on Well, so if we're talking about materials, I mean, here Gregory is using pipes, sure. and, you know, you can create a shopping list. Yeah, I mean, I remember one first thing that I read about your work was that essentially everything was available, you know, with yeah. three dials or one people or something of that nature. He just suggests that you're buying the parts that you visit. Different stores. But would, would you issue. say that part of what you maybe have in common is in each case the imagery is very surprising and off-putting. I mean, I can't. Mm -hmm. I don't think one is readily uh, seduced by seeing tortured taxidermy animals, or uh, you don't know, really aestheticize a pipe bomb, or you know these hooded figures are. Um, off-putting in a sense, they're 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 somewhat terrifying, yeah. and especially when I look at the hood and the red one, and I get a glimpse through the eye hole yes. of this figure on the other side, and all of a sudden it becomes highly sculptural, and I'm looking into that, wondering what who is this individual? What about this person that's hidden behind it? Yeah, I will say that like specifically. Do you want to take that? Oh, no. oh, specifically in regards to the choices I make in the type of tax term, is that uh, you know, I like the notion that in most cases, um, you know, these animals are essentially reduced to materials. I mean, these are very, these are all not only kittens, but they're very badly taxidermy kittens. So the idea is the notion. Did you taxidermy? I, I did do those, yeah. But that was the, you know, that was the intention to put like doll eyes in them. And, you know, I'm, like, I can, I'm not a great taxidermy, so I can do better than that, though. Um, so it was. Believe the wires come through the hands still, you know. But the idea is that they have been reduced to, 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 to simply a material, which is what you know. It's, at some point, it is, you know, and that's you know, and that's, and that's in the different. Place. And the idea of like that piece, the idea, um, if I may speak frankly, there's some technical issues with that piece that I would definitely change if I could do it again. But the idea is so many badly taxed or any animals, and the, and the fawn was actually like really well done. It's all on this level of tragic in such a way, but aesthetically. I want to think more tragic that the farm was in there than anything else. And you know, Gregory, when you're talking about installing a piece, he talks about, you know, fluffing them up a little bit, creating a nice wire. And, and I would say you can aestheticize a pipe bomb. Um, <laughs> nice. You know, that one from 88, uh, anything from 90 is a lot prettier. Oh. <laughs> and the craftsmanship is a big issue for you. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, the craftsmanship is a big issue. You know, um, I'm, I'm a visual person. Uh, I can, uh, the, the process of doing a lot of these works is first you learn how to do it, and, and, and it's a technical learning process. Um, and then as I do more and more of them, I've learned how to do them, and I have to occupy my mind in some sort of way. So I, I start thinking about other aesthetic issues and, 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 and developing them further. Um, here's, here's a question I have for you, if I may interrupt. Speaking, like, say, of ego, let's say, um, I got it. No, I just mean, no, my point is, let's say you have two people looking at the work, which is going to be more flattering. Like someone, let's say, an art gallery an enthusiast who thinks it's really beautiful, or a really good bomb maker who's like, damn, that guy can make a bomb. <laughs> I mean, that, that guy really knows how to construct this thing. You know, he really knows how to. Well, I've, I've uh, one of the first.
first big legal, well, not that big, not big enough legal problem, so I don't have to put the word. Um, no, it was a very big problem. Um, uh, I ended up afterwards um, uh, with an FBI agent's card in my wallet all the time, who um, was sort of the, the, uh, the, the uh, who, he was one of the heads of looking for the Unabomber and was also a major lecturer um, in the FBI world as to um, bomb designs. Um, and he would regularly, every uh, two, three, four <coughs> months, um, until he died in 97, um, and reti retired very shortly before there, um, he would regularly give me a call to say, you know, have you, have you figured out any new neat designs? Have you ran across anything that I'm not sure about? I'm always looking for new designs. Um, Did so you ever have any more? That, he's the only person who was a professional who actually really ever communicated to me in a positive way. An appreciation <laughs> for in, your in, 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 yeah, in an appreciation for my technique. Um, uh, uh, but but uh, I, I guess the most uh, complimentary one is the one that has their checkbook open. Mm -hmm. To be uh, perhaps, uh, yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> are, are there, yes. Did, did anyone um, who wasn't an FBI agent uh, contact you uh, with the positive comments on your bomb making skills? I've had um, the only other people that have talked to me um, who have actually built bombs were mostly art students. Oh. Um, <laughs> and uh, they all had the same story. Um, they did it in high school. Um, and the way they figured out how to do it was in their physics uh, book. They did everything that they were told not to do. So, but other than that, um, there is one convicted terrorist who I cannot say their name, her name, um, who just recently bought um, a, a book bomb, um, and it's now sitting on her coffee table in her in her mansion. Mansion. Yes. Successful. <laughs> There's plenty of clues in there if you know anything about the, the, the history uh, of America in the 70s. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm not allowed to say it. <laughs> Is there um, one last question from somebody? Oh. Okay, Neil. You got it. All right. Uh, so, probably predominantly, like visual art plays the low, lowest role in our cultural ladder. It's our lowest what? Lowest on the rung, cultural, okay. culturally in America. But you guys are all working this medium, and you're you're obviously provocating. And you're, I would say, more um, Gregory and Julie are using identifiable images that are uh, in our everyday um, news. Um, how do you think your work affects? Like, I think CNN is like really good art. I think it's really planned. I think you, all, all three of you plan really well. I think the work is really clean in that way. And I think CNN is really clean. I think the way arguments are constructed are really clean in our kind of everyday, everyday cultural uh, consumption. So how do you think your work affects what would be the, the grander effect of how CNN, Fox, blah, 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 CBS, works on the, our everyday consumption of political ideas, visual ideas, turning political ideas into visual ideas. How do you think you guys play into that? I mean, do you think you affect that? Do you antagonize that? <coughs> it's a very broad question. Are you subversive? Really I try and exploit it. Well, I, uh, you're the most so, okay. yeah. as an I, I, I literally try and exploit it. I'd say you first, you second, and you third. So that's, that's my answer. You promised, us, you promised an easy question. I think, well, you're done. You're off. I think that's a really good question, and I think that's a question I've asked myself for a really long time, and I've more recently become comfortable with the idea that um, I'm not competing with them in any sense, and I'm not, I'm not going to be naive about the fact that, like you said, visual arts is um, the bottom rung in our culture. Of course, that's what we teach. We hope it's you know, something more. But, but, but I think it's interesting that you describe it as clean because in some ways maybe that points to how I think about my studio practice, which is trying to clean
clear these thoughts, trying to clear this space of this really complicated situation that I have a, a personal connection to since I was, you know, based on the way I was raised, and I'm constantly trying to clear out that space and understand what it's about. And so, in a way, the, the white space is that is that space where I can have room to move, and I. You know, developed a set of characters in a way that I'm going to move around that represent maybe something more to me than just this hooded figure, but allow me that space to. Because I think that's that's I guess I embrace art in that sense as a kind of thought process, and it, and then it manifests visually, and then hopefully the thought process that manifests visually is interesting for other people to look at and talk about. And um, but I think it's a really important question because of course I expect that my work will relate somehow to the images we see on CNN. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think that definitely kind of um, affects these other two more. I'd say, yeah, probably Julie. Well, Julie maybe the most, I don't know. But, um, but again, yeah, the kind of, again, the cleanness of CNN and kind of the particular kind of resolution it has, you know, headline news at the end of a half hour, I mean, pretty much got a day's worth of perspective. Um, you know, and you go a little further, but you're never really going to know without being there. Um, and I mean, I think that's part of it. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't definitely. I've seen. I'm trying to think of another media source that you may be in the commercials. Well, I see maybe more commercials. The commercials. Um, commercials. Maybe an older version of MTV. What's that? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, no, indeed. And that, well, I mean, that's true. I mean, that's true. I mean, you know. Um, Steve Irwin's another, you know, crazy guy who yeah. wrestled with gators and things of that nature. I mean, that's that's a weird kind of association with nature that, to me, is I mean, it's it's a consumptive in a different way. But um, yeah, clearly that has changed things dramatically. So, yeah, constantly. But not to be quite as flippant as I first was. Um, yes, I'm <laughs> exploiting it, and um, one of the reasons for that is is I do such a and. Um, in many ways, if you think about that, um, doing that within the world of culture, it's it's really just um, you know, masturbating and calling. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, uh, uh, visual language is a language, um, and all of us and all of you out there who are trying to be artists and are artists, we have something to say, and what we have to say is valid. Um, and right now, um, we're mostly trapped um, uh, speaking to the converted. Um, and um, our voices are lost um, in, in our contemporary society. And one of the strategies within my work, particularly this work here, was to try and come up with a way to actually participate in the, in the dialogue of our contemporary society and to be a valid voice within that. So, so you want the news media? I want the news media. Want to be a I mean, right now, right right now with, with my blood pressure problems, I don't want the police to come. But to tell you the truth, one of the strategies of this work is to get the police to come. Um, it's, 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 it's bait on the end of the hook for, for, for those who intend to step beyond the limits of their power or have tendencies towards fascism. Well, and something <laughs> you're saying which is interesting is if the news, so you've had news stories about your work because in a way you've, oh, you've, you've created your work with that intention. Yes. So if a news story came in to talk about my work or your work, I don't know if we would, like how, what kind of headline could you, you know, place? Maybe it's not as... He's going to be talking about this Yeah, right. <laughs> well, maybe, you know, but, like I'm not thinking in that way, but I, I just wonder, like, my hope is that you couldn't simplify it, you know, and one, yeah. Well, no, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is difficult, well, they do. They want to simplify. Right. Um, and it is difficult to simplify. But there are, you know, you, there are sound bites you can come up with. Um, oh, I don't know. But, but, <laughs> but, but, my, hard. Yeah, but my encounters with the media, they've almost always started out um, awesome. Um, right. uh, extra tabloid news show did a, a segment on the rather long one, actually, so it was incredibly long program. And they had um, three different producers and uh, film and sound crews come out um, to interview me. Um, at, uh, uh, at an exhibition that I had at Magic Max Project Project Gallery in New York. Um, and each one was very obvious, the tone of the questions, was they wanted me to be the bad, crazy, evil um, artist. Um, and, yeah. 
but the works meant to be sensational. But they wanted, you know, the bad guy. Um, they wanted to build a fire. Um, and they wanted a one-liner. They wanted a one-liner. Um, so one day, I go through this, spend six hours with them talking endlessly. They go away. Two days later, I get a call from uh, uh, the producers at Exeter. They say, we're sending out another crew. Um, there was problems with that last one. We do the whole thing again. Um, and then uh, uh, then the weekend's there. And uh, that next Monday, they say, can we redo it again on Tuesday? Um, there was still more problems. They send out another crew. Um, and so we go re-go re through the whole thing, and at the end I go up to the producer and I say, you know, what's, what's going on? You know, I've, I've been, uh, you know, I've done these sorts of things many, many times before. Never had to repeat them over and over. And the guy said, well, you know what, to tell you the truth, um, uh, you weren't what we expected. And everybody that we sent out, um, by the time they came back, they actually understood what your work was about. <laughs> uh, and and, and they, they, they realized that you were actually, you know, a nice guy and that you had honorable intentions. In this world. Um, and so um, I'm here um, because uh, the, you know, the head people at Extra finally gave up on the direction they wanted and now I'm supposed to put something else together. Um, and so, um, the, 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 the show ended up, the, the segment ended up going on. Um, it was actually rather nice. And uh, in terms of titles, um, and this is like you know, for my own ego right now, <laughs> but it's, it's a great thing. Um, uh, you know how on extra they have like the presenter at the desk and they have an image behind it. Um, in one section of the, 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 the segment, um, there was the presenter talking to me, talking about, you know, we're being serious, transgressive, and, and now we're going to, you know, uh, hear what uh, Sergeant Sarah and so and so from the Los Angeles Bomb Squad has to say about this work. But there's a picture of me, a headshot of me up above his shoulder, and below it, it says, "Evil genius?" Question. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll uh, end the evening with that. Thank you all for coming.